Hello, welcome back. I hope you're having a great week. Today I want to talk with you about an issue many people have with the Seven Laws. As we all know, the list of the Seven Laws was developed by the sages and codified in the Talmud. So naturally people think to themselves, did the rabbis just make this list up? I don't see these laws for Gentiles referenced in the Torah itself. But here's the thing. In reality, the details of the seven laws of Noah appear all throughout the Torah very plainly, but you have to know what you're looking for. So today I'm going to show you one small example of this from Parsha Vayeshev and the story of Yosef and his brothers. Now, I assume you're already familiar with the story. The 12 sons of Israel have a dispute of sorts. Yosef's older brothers decide to kill him and he gets sold into slavery. But keep in mind, this is all taking place before the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. So all of, the, all of the brothers were effectively living as Noahides following the seven laws of Noah. So when we see them making moral decisions, they're applying their knowledge of the seven laws of Noah, which is instructive to us. So with that in mind, let's go through the story together and I'll highlight some details you've probably never noticed. In this one short section of the Parsha, in Bereshith 37, we'll see the prohibition against murder, the obligation to stop a rodef, and at least two ways to stop a rodef when you can't physically overpower them, and much more. Now, the story begins in Bereshith 37.17, where it says, So Yosef went after his brothers, and he found them in Dothan. And they saw him from afar, and when he had not yet drawn near to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. So they said one to the other, Behold, that dreamer is coming. So now let us kill him, and we will cast him into one of the pits, and we will say, A wild beast devoured him. And then we will see what will become of his dreams. So, right off the bat, we're presented with a group of men planning to commit murder. This is one of the seven laws, the prohibition against murder. So we know this story will shed some light on this prohibition because, keep in mind, the point of the Torah isn't to teach us history or science. It's to teach us morality. So that's what we should be trying to learn from each of its stories. So as we read, their plan is to murder their brother, hide his body in a pit or a well, and then tell their father he'd been eaten by wild animals. So continuing on, in Bereshith 37.21, it says, But Reuven heard, and he saved him from their hands. And he said, Let us not deal him a deadly blow. And Reuven said to them, Do not shed blood. Cast him into this pit which is in the desert, but do not lay a hand upon him, in order to save him from their hands, to return him to his father. So here we have an example of the obligation to stop a rodef, or a pursuer which is part of the prohibition against murder. For those unfamiliar with this concept, it basically means that when you see someone about to commit murder, you have an obligation to stop them and to save their potential victim. And here it is displayed clearly in the text. We have Reuven, the oldest brother, who is not on board with this murderous scheme that his brothers have hatched. And so now he views them as a group of pursuers that he needs to stop. But even the way he goes about this is instructive to us. You see, normally when pe most people think of the obligation to stop a rodef, they think of physically stopping them in some way. However, in this case, Reuven is presented with a situation where he's outnumbered nine to one, so clearly he can't overpower them. But what can you do in a situation like that? Well, from this example, we learn that perhaps you can try to reason with them, or failing that, to outwit them, which is exactly what Reuven tries to do here. So how does he try to reason with them? Knowing that their father educated them in Noahide halacha, he starts by literally quoting one of the seven laws of Noah to them, saying, Al tishpachu dam, do not shed blood, or do not murder, literally. It's worth noting that this is literally the phrase used by the sages when they codified the seven laws. So in the Talmud, they're essentially quoting Reuven here. So if you want to literally see the seven laws in the Torah, here's a Noahide telling other Noahides, do not murder. It doesn't get much clearer than that. However, knowing that his brothers probably won't listen to reason, 
Reuven then tries to outwit them and buy some time. So he tells them to just throw Yosef into the pit so they can come up with a better plan. And while they're doing that, he'll try to sneak back and save him. So continuing on in Bereshith 37.23, it says, Now it came to pass when Yosef came to his brothers that they stripped Yosef of his shirt, of the fine woolen coat which was upon him. And they took him and cast him into the pit. Now the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. So they've agreed to go along with Reuben's plan. And rather than immediately killing Yosef, they've just thrown him into the pit and are now having a meal and trying to come up with a better plan to deal with Yosef. But the Torah said something odd there, which you might have missed. It says, Now the pit was empty and there was no water in it. But what does that have to do with anything? It seems rather random and nonsensical, doesn't it? I'm sure the pit also didn't contain giraffes or ladders, but it doesn't mention either of those. But remember, the sages teach us that the Torah is very precise and economical in its language. Every phrase, every word, every letter is there for a reason. And that reason is to teach us morality. So what is this phrase, the pit was empty and there was no water in it, teaching us? It's actually making a direct reference to an obscure detail of the laws of murder, which is discussed at great length in the halakha. The astute reader who knows halakha thoroughly would realize that the very act of them throwing Yosef into a pit or a well and leaving him there could be considered an act of murder based on several criteria. First, if the pit was filled with a small amount of water, not being able to see the bottom when he fell, there's a high likelihood he would have been severely injured in the fall and might be lying at the bottom bleeding to death. Second, if, if it was filled with deep water and they had left him there swimming, he might drown when he runs out of strength. Or third, pits filled with water are likely to contain foul or noxious air that's dangerous to breathe, so he would be likely to suffocate if they left him down there. Under any of those criteria, the Torah would hold the brothers liable in a court of law for murdering Yosef. So the text is reassuring the astute reader that none of these cases is true, and they didn't think that they had left Yosef in imminent danger. So again, even this seemingly out-of-place phrase is actually a lesson in the details of the prohibition against murder, if you're paying attention. Now let's continue reading in Bereshith 37.25 where it says, And they lifted their eyes and saw, and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead, and their camels were carrying spices, balm, and lotus, going to take it down to Egypt. And Yehudah said to his brothers, What is the gain if we slay our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, but our hand shall not be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brothers hearkened. So as they're eating, they come up with their alternative plan to kidnap Yosef and sell him into slavery rather than murder him. Not really a great improvement, and of course still a violation of the seven laws. I'm not going to go into great detail about it here, but if you continue analyzing the story, you'll find all the details of the prohibition against kidnapping here, which is included in our prohibition against theft. But continuing on, in Bereshith 3728, or Meanwhile Back at the Pit, then Midianite men, merchants, passed by, and they pulled and lifted Yosef from the pit, and they sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites for twenty silver pieces, and they brought Yosef to Egypt. And Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Yosef was not in the pit, so he rent his garments. And he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where will I go? So while his brothers were having their meal, Reuven sneaks off to the pit to save Yosef and take him back to the safety of their father's house. But before he could arrive, a traveling caravan of Midianite merchants come across Yosef, lift him out of the pit, and carry him off to be sold as a slave. And when Reuven finds the pit empty, he returns to his brothers in a panic. As the story continues in Bereshith 3731, And they took Yosef's coat, and they slaughtered a kid, and they dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the fine woolen coat, and they brought it to their father, and they said, We have found this. Now recognize whether, whether it is your son's coat or not. He recognized it, and he said, It is my son's coat. A wild beast has devoured him. Yosef has surely been torn up. 
Now, various of the sages have different opinions on whether the brothers knew that Yosef had been kidnapped or not. Personally, I side with the Rashbam on this, whose opinion is that they did not know he'd been kidnapped, and they actually believed he had been eaten by a wild animal. And I think there's pretty clear proof of that from what Reuven says when the brothers are reunited later in Egypt. In fact, what Reuven says there is a really profound lesson in the laws of murder, justice, and teshuvah for Noahides. But that's in the next Parsha, Parsha Mikes, so we'll have to cover that next time, because that's all the time I have today. So I hope this has helped you to see that the details of the seven laws of Noah appear all throughout the written Torah if you know what you're looking for. In just this one small fragment of Parsha Vayeshev, we've seen the prohibition against murder, the obligation to stop a rodef, at least two ways to stop a rodef if you can't physically overpower them. And that's not even considering other topics this Parsha talks about, like theft, kidnapping, and Lashon Hara, which we didn't even look at. But that's the whole purpose of the Torah, to teach us morality by showing us how God's laws are applied in real-world situations. But we don't study Torah as a purely intellectual exercise. Remember, we study in order to do. So what can you do with this knowledge you've just learned? Well, you can start by reading the Parsha, the weekly Torah portion, every week. If you make this a regular practice, I guarantee that every time you read it, you'll find new insights and new depths of meaning in it, that are relevant to you as a Noahide. And you can also like this video and subscribe to our channel, and we'll strive to make more videos like this for you, highlighting the seven laws of Noah in the weekly Parsha. So until next time, shalom, shalom, and have a great week.